So I'm a third year PhD student at the Beale College uh, London, and I'm going to present this work, uh, which is about computer vision, and in particular the problem of simultaneous localization and mapping. So first of all, a couple of definitions. So what's this problem called simultaneous localization and mapping? So it's the problem that given a, a moving sensor, which can be a camera, uh, you want to jointly estimate the camera position and uh, an idea of the world that the camera is actually observing. So some sort of, uh, you want to estimate the map, like the, how the environment looks like. Um, we are actually focusing, I mean, there are very various flavors of these, of these techniques, and we focus on dense lamp, which uh, essentially means that uh, the geometry you recover about the, uh, of the world is completely dense. You can, you, can, you can recover the full continuous mesh of the world, as you can see in this picture. Um, in these algorithms, usually, you can exploit some sort of uh, depth sensor, like the Kinect one, in which uh, all the stream of, of depth images get fused into a coherent, into a coherent representation, uh, which give you back the, the, the full geometry reconstruction. Um, so these methods, uh, in particular, is, uh, is, uh, is called Kinect Fusion and is a volumetric method. What does it mean, volumetric? It means that the, the world is represented in a cube, which is discretized in voxels, and each voxel holds the distance from the closest surface. So as you can see in this picture here, um, uh, the, if this red line is the actual surface, you can see that the voxels around them, and they contain like distance bodies, and uh, the actual surface in the, in, the, in the voxel cube is encoded where the, where the value is zero, so at the zero crossing of this implicit representation. Um, Below you can see the algorithmic pipeline of this algorithm, uh, which is a, a closed loop. So you get an input point cloud from the depth sensor, you align it with the previous point cloud, so you can recover your position. And once you get uh, your position recovered, you can actually fuse the new data into the representation. Uh, the next step is render the, the word that, that you have just observed in such a way that you can use this prediction to align with the next depth frame. And this goes on in a, in a tight loop. So, okay. so in, this, in, this, in this work, we're going, we're going to, uh, to talk about octree, so, which is a way of representing efficiently this uh, volumetric function. Uh, why is that? Because usually volumetric methods are really expensive. It means like that to cover, like for instance, 10 meter, 10 cube, cube meters at one centimeter resolution, you, you need at least four gigabytes of memory, which is a lot. Uh, and there's a lot if you think that the actual uh, world is mostly empty. So most of the, of the world, I mean, most, most of the space encoded doesn't hold any meaningful geometric information. Um, so for instance, these, these are like three scenes from a, from a data set we use. And in red is the, the, um, are the voxels which doesn't hold any, which don't hold any information, while in blue, are the voxel that, um, that all the significant information. So clearly there is a huge, uh, there, is, there are huge opportunities to, to exploit all this sparseness, this inherent sparsity of the, of the world. Um, so clearly in the, lecture, there are, in the literature there are like two main approaches. One is based on a hierarchical list of structure like oak trees and cube trees. And uh, the other one, like, is uh, based on flat hash tables, so voxel hashing. And uh, this is actually current, uh, the state of the art. But in this talk, we will, we will actually be uh, focusing on, uh, on in the theoretical less efficient uh, data structure, which are octrees. So why, why do we think that octrees are interesting? Well, first of all, they accomplish the task, which is, like, uh, which is exploiting sparsity. Uh, but they don't just exploit sparsity they also act as a spatial index of the scene. So you know, I mean, the tree structure already gives you like the structure of the, the world that you're looking at. And you can exploit that for various, for various um, tasks like uh, collision detections or uh, navigations. So it's a, it's a richer data structure which can bring you like a huge advantages. <coughs> and um, we think it's important to, to have an efficient uh, 
implementation of it. So what's an octree, just, just to, to make sure that everyone is on, on the same page. So if this is a cube, which it is, uh, an octree, <laughs> roughly. <laughs> um, so an octree is a regular recursive decomposition of the, of the cube. So each dimension is divided by two. That means that you're creating, creating like subsequent octants as you go down in the level of recursive. So we have a big block, which is divided in eight cubes, which is divided recursively in all the eight cubes till a certain maximum level of split, which defines your actual resolution. Uh, what's the problem with this data structure is that, well, it's a tree, and uh, whenever you want to operate on it, like in, in parallel, uh, you have to be clever, and you have to, be, to do stuff very efficiently, because they have an inherent uh, overhead compared to just dense pre-allocated pre voxel grids. So in this talk, in fact, uh, I'm going to describe, it's going to be a bit technical, but I'm going to describe uh, our efficient information fusion algorithm in this data structure, our simplest strategy, which is required to actually extract data from this data structure, and um, uh, concluding like our future work to bring all this stuff in real time to small uh, CPUs, to really mobile CPUs. So first of all, uh, I'm gonna describe the data structure. So what's the actual data? So as I said, uh, actually, just go back one second. Uh, just forget one piece of information. So this is the volume. This is the function we are encoding. An important bit uh, is that information is just encoded in a bandwidth uh, outside the bandwidth. So which uh, the bandwidth is close to the surface. Outside the bandwidth, there is no information at all. So that's where the sparsity comes from. So now going back to where we were. So that means that the only voxels we are interested in are the ones that are close to the surface, which contain actual information. So in this, in this, in this perspective, uh, we, are, we can see voxels just simply as an aggregated, uh, an array of aggregated uh, blocks which contain meaningful information. And the, the octree, the data structures that allows us to index and retrieve the correct voxel given a, a, a query position. So as I said, like the octree is, an, is, a, is a regular decomposition of the, of the three-dimensional space, which also encode the, the structure. So we have internal nodes, and uh, each node has eight children, uh, which can uh, allow you to descend the, the hierarchy to retrieve the correct voxel block for a given query position. Uh, so if you recall, the pipeline first starts with, a, with the alignment. And once the alignment is done, we have to fuse the new uh, information into the tree. Now the problem is the tree is actually empty at the very beginning, so we have to populate the tree. And we have to do it fast because otherwise you lose completely the advantage of using a sparse data structure. So we have first to infer which, kind, which blocks, which voxel blocks need to be allocated. And we do this by raycasting the, the scene from the current depth image and retrieving all the intersected, intersected vox, uh, voxel block along the intersection section, uh, along the truncation region. So in this way, we collect everything that needs to be allocated on the map. Now the problem is, uh, we need to do this, as I said, we need to do this allocation in parallel as, uh, as fast as possible, because this needs to be like in the 30 millisecond budget. So how do we do that? So we have a particular strategy uh, based on Morton numbering. So uh, for those one of you that are familiar with space filling curves, this is not new. Uh, but I'll try to give you an example of what a Morton number is and why it's useful in our case. So uh, I think the easiest way to think about Morton numbers are, is like a linearization of three-dimensional coordinates. Essentially, given a three-dimensional position, x, y, z, you combine those three coordinates in one single number, which uniquely identify the, the voxel. Uh, there is an example down there. Uh, so if you look at the bit pattern of the x, y, and z coordinate, 1, 3, 0, uh, you interleave, you get that number down there. Uh, what, why is this uh, interesting and crucial? Uh, well, uh, they have an, an interesting property, which is the prefix of this number identify the parent in the tree. So as you can see, so given this node here, all these children share the same prefix with the, same, with, uh, with the parent node. And uh, we exploit this property to do allocation very, very efficiently. So essentially, our algorithm is uh, we first sort all the codes that need to be allocated. 
We get a prefix for the first, uh, for the level of the tree which we are allocating. We, comp we remove the duplicates that will be generated because parents share different children. And um, we allocate those nodes entirely in parallel. What's the key here is that once you start from the root uh, and you go down to the next level and the next level, you always have, you're always sure that the previous levels have been allocated. So you can do the allocation fully in parallel without any synchronization. So the only synchronization that you have is the barrier at each level of the tree. And this turns out is a, it's a, it's a big winner. So once we've done that, we can, our, our tree has been allocated, and we can just collect all the voxels that have been allocated, and we can update them, um, which way, in the way that I say. So for each, for each voxel, uh, so let's say this point here, to allocate that, we just need to, uh, to take the distance and do a moving average of these estimates. So how does it look like? This is like, for instance, a, a render of that. So this is a living room, and and this, and this is what this looks like when, when you reconstruct it. Um, as I said, uh, the next step in the pipeline is to actually uh, render a view that you will use to align yourself with the next frame. And this is done by ray casting. Now, ray casting is pretty expensive. It's already expensive in a regular grid, uh, but it can be dramatically more expensive in a, in, a, in a tree because of the latency that you have to access the data. So it's absolutely fundamental to do, to do that sampling uh, as efficiently as possible. Uh, to this goal, we have uh, developed like this uh, cute algorithm. Uh, so in this slide, I will describe what the problem is, which is subtle. So as I said, like the world is a collection of, uh, of, uh, of aggregated voxels, right? So when you do, um, so when you do a, a sample of a continuous field, you do usually 3 linear interpolation, which means uh, that you have to collect eight sampling points and linearly interpolate between them. Now, if your sampling point ends in the middle of a voxel cube, you are good because you, are, uh, you, can, you have all your points local there, and so you pay just one tree traversal per eight points that you have to gather. Uh, if you are less lucky, let's say you are very unlucky, you actually end up in a corner between like uh, all different voxel blocks, in which case, you have to collect, uh, to pay all the three traversals to retrieve the, the, pr the proper points. Uh, the, and then there's the middle case, which is some points are local, some are not. And it turns out like that uh, dealing with this situation efficiently is, is fundamental because uh, if you gather those points in the wrong order, you're gonna pay much more, many more traversal of the tree compared to what you should be doing. To explain that, uh, this slide explained that. So let's look on the left. So if you need those four points and you gather one, two, three, and four in that sequence, essentially what you're going to do is to pay three traversal every time. Uh, I mean, two, three traversal more than what you should be doing because you will, uh, you will invalidate what you, what, you, what you gather before. Even if you cache it, you're still going to invalidate the cache. So what you instead we should be doing is to to traverse the tree, uh, to, to gather the point in the order which, uh, which maximizes locality. So in this case, it would be one, two, three, and four. Uh, so to do that, we, we simply noted that, uh, well, this can be statically compute, pre-computed, and uh, we have a, we, we simply have compile time. We just have a, we generate a lookup, a lookup table that can, that can give you the, perf the, the right order, the right sampling order, given the, uh, the, the point position. So just the runtime, you just have to look at the, you just have to select the correct traversal order. And, uh, and this is uh, quite a big performance advantage. So this is the building block of the, of, uh, of the sampling. To retrieve the, the, actual, the actual surface, you have, to, you have to raycast. And that's where the octree actually gives you a lot of advantage because you can simply skip completely empty space by, skip, by casting array, traversing the boxes from uh, big to, 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 from coarse to fine level till you get the first uh, leaf block intersect, and then you can do the sampling in a sequential way. Uh, this is pretty much our work, uh, and we can I will show you now some uh, some some results. So the the results we have collected. Uh, we have implemented these uh, pipelines in uh, on CPU uh, for one reason because uh, so this this algorithm is usually they are very well suited for GPU computing because they are. Uh, there are massively parallel um, computations, uh, but the GPU could be busy actually doing something else, like uh, the natural application of this 
algorithms. It can be augmented reality, virtual reality, so you might need to do rendering on top of it. Um, so, or in other situations, uh, in other situation like uh, uh, flying drones and, uh, oh, I, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you might not have a GPU. I just, yeah, uh, this computer doesn't. Um, yeah, so, so these, so those are like uh, uh, frame per seconds. So you can, I mean, you can see that we are there. Um, so what I want to get to is that, yeah, we have demonstrated. What I was saying is that we have demonstrated like uh, real-time performance on CPU algorithms that were before. Uh, obtain this kind of performance only on fat GPUs like Titan X, that kind of, that kind of class. And uh, the spatial index you gain by, by having oak trees can be useful in a variety of, uh, of applications. And that's what we were interested in, and we are applying that to robot navigation at the moment. And uh, finally, what's the future work? Well, the thing is, we get, we're getting on CPU now roughly 30 frames per second on, on, on a desktop class CPU. If we want to move to real mobile props, so we have to do uh, much less work. I mean, we must optimize a lot this algorithm. And uh, technically, that means uh, both algorithmic improvements, which can come in a variety of ways, but also low-level optimizations, which is where ARM actually, I think, uh, can come into play, like full pipeline vectorization, me efficient memory layout, and branch divergence uh, minimizations. But also, why not dedicate a hardware platform? Although these algorithms are like a, a sort of moving target because they're evolving very fast, um, people are looking into dedicated hardware for this kind of reconstruction. And surely, I mean, they are very well suited. And uh, that's pretty much it. Sorry about uh, the delay. <laughs>